Good morning. This is the November 16, 2023. Meeting in the series Board of Review. This hearing is being held via video conference call WebEx at the following locations Hughes State Office Building, Main Hearing Room, First Floor, 333 East Washington Street, Syracuse, New York, 13202. Time now is 9.36, and this hearing is officially open. The members of the board are to my far left, Gail Swistak, to my right, Andrew Garlock, to my Immediate left, Jeffrey Hunterleiter. My name is C. Thomas Parks. I'm chairman of this board. From the Department of State, we have Thomas Petulia. We will now hear the scheduled petitions. When you, when you speak, please address the board with your given name, title, and legal address so that our court reporter can have all the information requested. We may have to stop from time to time to consult with our technical staff. For making comments to the board, please provide a descriptive narrative on matters referring to your exhibits to enable the court reporter to enter these into the record. We will now hear the first hearing in the matter of Falls and Properties LLC, petition number 203 055. Uh, let's see. Hello? One second. And this is an application that's been submitted by Hello? David yep. Julio of Policy Properties LLC, 13 Upper Street, Utica, New York. Uh, it was filed pursuant to 19 NYCR 1205 on October 4, 2023, and upon all other papers in the matter. And this is in regards to a variance for Chapter 61B of the Consolidated Laws of New York State, Multiple Residence Law. Article 3, Section 30, Seller Seals. Okay, Mr. Julio, do you have anything you'd like to talk, present to the board other than what's already been submitted in your application? Um, uh, sir, um, I'm having a hard time picking you up with the audio, but I think I know what, what, you, what you asked me was, uh, did I have anything to present other than what's in the application? Um, I think the application um, kind of says, uh, um, you know, my position is, and again, that is that um, it would be almost impossible to comply um, without like um, very expensive uh, renovations. Uh, you'd have to remove all the utilities, all the tenants, be no heat, no electric, no plumbing into the building um, while the, while the uh, uh, ceiling was being uh, sheetrocked. Um, so we're, we're applying for a variance and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, we can work something out, that'd be great. Okay. Uh, one relief that's uh, provided in the, in the uh, uh, mobile reservoir is uh, you can be exempt from putting a ceiling in if you put a uh, limited area sprinkler system in the basement. Have you uh, looked into uh, putting a limited area sprinkler system into the basement? So I think that would be uh, too expensive as well um, to put a sprinkler system in. Um, I think we proposed uh, alternate relief, uh, maybe putting heat, heat alarms in uh, series with the, the other smoke alarms in, in the building, and they all be interconnected. Do you have a cost of uh, what the sprinkler would have cost? You have an estimate? I, I, I didn't, I didn't uh, even research it as an option. I mean, do you have a cost? Is what it would cost, or? No, no. You're the applicant. You, you said it. Was <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't research that. So, I mean, we could. Uh, I mean, I could ask for an adjournment and you know get a cost on that. But I'm, I'm sure it'd be. Uh, I, honestly, I don't know what it would cost, but I imagine it'd be pretty expensive. Questions from members of the board? I I think that when you're coming to the coming asking for a variance and the code has a prescriptive path that allows for a sprinkler system we, we need to see that that's an actual hardship not just anecdotal um, we need to see that what you've done to, to comply with uh, you're, you're kind of breaking up sir i, I do apologize so, uh, is anybody else having a hard time hearing us are you having a hard time hearing us? I, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Yeah. 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 Um, I do think I can hear you good. 
Speak a little louder, Mr. Parsons, please. We adjust the, is that better? Because I'm running close. Or is that any better? It, it, it's, it's just not clear. Um, uh, the other lady was very clear. Yeah, it's a it's a little distorted. Yeah. I do I do hear Mr. Gigilio very clear. Okay. Is is that any better now? Yes, it is. Okay. All right. There we go. We were just on the wrong microphone. Let me put that back there. Okay. All right. So what I what I had stated was to what the chairman is saying as well, and it's that the code has a prescriptive path that says an alternative to the, the ceiling covering is a sprinkler system. And so I, I echo the chairman's uh, comment on, um, you know, we if, if it's a hardship, we need to see the hardship. Um, I'd have an, anecdotal one. evidence of just that. Oh well, it's it's going to be a lot of money. Um, but we need to put that in context so it's in the record. You're asking for um, a variance to a life safety measure of the code, so we need to see um, and have in the record what what that what that hardship actually is. Right, right. And again, I didn't even research the safety of a sprinkler system in there. I mean, that might make anything worse. Um, you know, you may spray water all over your electric panels. That may cause a fire. I mean, I don't. I mean, a worse fire. Um, so I, I don't know exactly, you know, all of the details of a sprinkler system in a basement. I didn't even consider it as an option. I'd have to research that and figure out what issues would arise with the sprinkler system. Um, so I, I don't have that information in front of me as I didn't consider it an option. I didn't see it anywhere in, in the code. What, uh, uh, this is uh, Mr. Parsons speaking. Um, what, uh, what is in the basement? What, what is down there other than the heating system that you mentioned? Uh, electric panels, we have four electric panels, one for each apartment. Um, we have a house panel. We have um, hot water tanks, furnaces, washers, dryers, 30 amp circuits on the dryers. Um, okay. Other than that, I don't know. Do you, store, do you store anything in the basement? Are there any, is there any uh, unused furniture stored in the basement? Is there any uh, mattresses stored in the basement? Any paints stored in cabinets in the basement? I'm sure there's paints and stuff in there. Um, as far as mattresses, I, I, I know the tenants do store clothes and stuff down there. I'm not sure if they have mattresses as well, but they're welcome to store their belongings in the basement. That would be the only storage area available. Because you have one, you have a washing machine. I assume it's warm down there, so it's not. It's nothing freezes in the basement. Right. It's heat. Well, it's not heated, but right, it's it's not freezing down there. Correct. Oh, all right. And all the water service and the sanitary uh, uh, pipes, they come from the upper floors down into the basement area? Yes, everything comes from the basement or finishes in the basement, correct? Okay. I, I've answered all the questions. I, does anybody have any more questions for the applicant? Okay. I, uh, Mr. Foster, I see you're here. I have a moment, a couple questions for you. Yes, I do. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Foster. Um, with these prescriptive fire alarms that are put that are provided under under this variance uh, application, do you uh, actually review and inspect the installation of uh, the devices? I do. Um, I, I want to make sure I'm clear on your on your uh, your question. So once the variance is uh, approved by the board. The variance goes back to me and the owner, and then I contact the owner for installation time frame. And then once the owner contacts me, I actually do a physical uh, inspection myself personally um, as the fire marshal in the city of Utica, and I um, make sure that the variance is to the letter of the law. Is there a building permit that's issued or electrical permit issued for this installation? Yes. Um, the owner is 
advise that, again, once he gets the variance from the board, that any applicable building permit, construction permits, or any type of electrical permits, um, all of that has to be uh, pulled down at City Hall prior to any work being done. What about annual inspections? Uh, do you do you do inspections of the fire alarm, uh, the smoke alarms, um, as though it's a fire alarm annually? Is there a, a requirement by the city that they're inspected annually to make sure that they're all in working order? That is correct, Mr. Parsons. Okay. So do they have to? They get that as part of a permit for occupancy, or how do how do you know that the the properties been, that these devices have been inspected annually? So that falls under the fire marshal's office for those for those systems in in a building that's uh, either residential or multiple dwelling. Uh, the fire marshal's office has a separate list uh, pertaining to all variances and obviously all um, applicable systems in any building in the city is um, inspected uh, once a year for the most part, six months to to <laughs> once a year. And for what we're talking about as far as the variance is concerned, we go back every 36 months to reinspect uh, any of the properties under our 1203 program. But the systems in each building pertaining to a variance from the board is uh, inspected every year. We ask for records um, and upkeep, upkeeping records, if you will. Okay. And are they tested every year to? To make sure that they're all operating and they're interconnected. That's correct. Okay. Um, the devices that are installed in the rooms, um, they're in, in the in the dwelling units. They're installed uh, just inside the room. Do we? Do you know that if the, they're loud enough to be heard in the sleeping areas, so that if there's an alarm at night, they would be able to know that the that, it, that there's a fire alarm or or a problem with in the basement. Yes, um, they, they are loud enough. I've tested them myself again during inspections of installation uh, after the board has issued the variances and um, they are loud enough. They are. Okay, so they can be heard in all the sleeping rooms. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Okay, I think we're going to do we want to take a few minutes to deliberate. Um, how do you want to? Think it could be beneficial. Okay. Um, we're going to take a few minutes and go into recess while we do a, a, some deliberation on this case, and we will be back in a few in a few minutes. Uh, Maureen, we can go off the record. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Welcome, sir. On the record. Thank you. After a brief deliberation. Um, in regard to petition number 2023-0515, and this is uh, Palsy Properties LLC, um, the board uh, has decided that it would like to adjourn this case and give the applicant time to come back and provide us with an estimate of cost to put the sprinkler system in the basement. Um, in addition, um, looking at this particular case, the proposed uh, Mediation or mediation for the for the uh, uh, or mitigation, excuse me, the proposed mitigation. Uh, we don't uh, as we don't feel it's adequate, and uh, we, we've communicated with Mr. Giulio, who will communicate with the with the city just to advise them that we're going to be looking for more of a commercial uh, fire uh, alarm and uh, automatic detection system, particularly to the basement and for this building. Uh, rather than the interconnected uh, residential devices. So that's where we are at in this case. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, let's see, hold on a second. De Giulio. De Giulio, yes, Mr. It's Giulio. Giulio. There's no, there's no De Giulio. It's just Giulio. Giulio. I apologize. It's just, there's no D in it. <laughs> Giulio. Okay. Um, so um, you understand what we're requesting, and then uh, you can come back in next month, and we can uh, look at look at the variance, and um, after we understand the cost um, that that creates the hardship for this. Okay. Um, I, I think I think uh, you, you were speaking about something about interconnected devices in the basement. Um, 
Yeah, kind of what's the, the, the proposed med mitigation that that was here was uh, uh, existing smoke alarms and hardwired, including smoke alarms devices in the cellar. Uh, we we are not that to, in our opinion. Uh, as, as a board, we don't believe this is sufficient for a mitigation on this uh, application. So even if you if you come back, say the sprinklers, you know, a hundred thousand dollars, and I'm just using a or two hundred thousand dollars or three hundred thousand, and you say, okay, we want it. This is our our mitigation. We're, well, what I'm saying is that the mitigation that's proposed using interconnected devices um, that are used in the residential units is is not sufficient we, we believe a higher level of detection uh, needs to be installed and mr yeah. uh, Dutulio, mr Dutulio can can share that information with you so you'll have a chance to understand that and and also get a uh if you need to get some prices on that installation okay um so i, I don't yeah um i got a question you you said the residential interconnected devices are not adequate. Is there a commercial? Yeah. Yes. Interconnected there devices. There's a there, what what you would like if a new apartment building was being constructed, they typically install a manual fire alarm system and put uh, 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 smoke or heat alarms in public spaces or in spaces that are unprotected. So that's that's what happens, and and you, and those automatic fire alarms also report out to a central station that in the case of a fire or a fire alarm condition in the building reports to the fire department. Okay. Um, and let me see. So I, I, I don't mean to take up too much of your time. No. So we would need sure. intercon interconnected devices in the hallways. Is that what you public public uh, areas? No. <laughs> uh, Mr. Dutu. Well at the basement. Yeah, yes. Mr. Dutulio will pro provide you with the information for it. I, oh, there's a Mr. Du there is a Mr. Dugilio on the line, so I'm just Julio and there's a Mr. Dutulio. 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 <laughs> yeah, it's a DIT thing. First, the oh, so there's two of us. <laughs> <laughs> that's why that's the problem, Mr. Dugilio. Um So I'll get a hold of you and I'll send you an email and you can give me a call. We can go through what okay. the, the board is looking for and that Appreciate way. It. Bring it back in December. It's the 21st. Will be the next hearing in December, so okay. we can get it resolved, and um, I'll set to go for the next hearing. Okay. Uh, I appreciate it. Thanks. Can I address the board, Mr. Foster? Yes, you can. Thank you. So uh, I want to apologize to the board. I forgot to introduce myself, uh, Gerald Foster, uh, G E R L D F O S T E R, Fire Marshal for the City of Utica Fire Department. I forgot to add that last time, Mr. Parsons. So, Mr. Uh, Gilio, um, Mr. Dettilio is going to reach out to you, and then between yes. him, you, and I, I can give you some direction on how to go from here to to satisfy what the board is looking for. So, I don't want you to feel confused or like you didn't get your variance, but the board is just asking for a little bit more that I can, myself and uh, Mr. Dettilio can guide you in that direction, okay? Appreciate it, Mr. Foster. All right. One, one, other, one, one other thing before we move on upon this case, let me, let me, um, and, and I don't think we, while we talked about it during deliberation, I want to put it uh, before you that our concerns relative to the basement is not that ju it's just uh, doesn't have a separation as far as a hard ceiling, but that there's storage down there. There's uh, washers and dryers. All all of these things are fuel and sources of ignition for a fire. And that in the basement, when you have pipes that are leading from the basement up to the upper floors, these become avenues for fire to spread from the basement into the interior of the building, inside the walls. Um, and if undetected or late detection, um, could be catastrophic not only to the building but could put but put the occupants in danger if that so situation occurred. So that's why we're looking at, you know, we ask those questions about what's in the basement. Okay. Very good. All right. Thanks. Thank you. What's that? Yep. Oh, sorry. We got a few emotion. So I want to make a moat. Uh, if I can get the board member to make a motion to table this. I'll make that motion. Okay. Mr. And later made a motion that we uh, adjourn this case to a later date. Um, 
Do I have second? second. Ms. Swistak seconds. Okay, I pull the board. Mr. Garlock? Aye. Ms. Swistak? Aye. Mr. Interlater? Aye. Mr. Parsons vote ayes, four ayes, no nays. Um, this case has been uh, adjourned to a later date. All righty, thanks. Yep. Very good. Bye. Bye. Jerry, don't go anywhere. All right. Yes, don't. Mr. Foster, stick with us. We got, I think you're, this is your next case. Yes, sir. So we're looking at uh, DB Realty. Here we go. Um, our, our next case is uh, petition number 2023-0547 in the matter of petition of Dmitry Rutitsky of DB Realty Solutions, LLC. And this is for a variance of Chapter 61B of the Consolidated Laws uh, of New York Multiple Residence Law. And uh, the applicant is seeking relief of uh, 61B of the Consolidated Laws of New York State, Multiple Residence Law, Article 3, Section 30, Seller Ceilings. Okay. And, uh, and I apologize, Mr. Brutitsky, can you, uh, do you, do you have anything you'd like to present uh, regarding this case and uh, any additional information that you'd like to share to the board? I think Mr. Bertitsky, are you, are you there? You're muted if you are. Hello? All right, don't. What phone number is he at? Three, three, two. Three two, yeah. Yeah, he's three one five nine five, last number three two. Yep, we're showing him muted. Yeah, let me see if I can request him to unmute. Okay. He's using his phone. Yeah, I know. I see. All right, there he goes. There he is. Hi. Uh yeah, so I what I was saying was I don't have any other information other than what I provided in the application and the exhibits. Okay, um, let's see. Let's start Have now uh, as part of relief for uh, that there's a, there's a uh, prescriptive relief on this uh, hard covering of the, or, or fire separation at the basement level and as to install a sprinkler system. Have you uh, uh, looked into installing the sprinkler system into the basement? Um, no, I have not. I was leaning more towards having a hardwired alarm system installed, um, but this is my first time doing this, so I don't know exactly, uh, you know, what the best way to go is, but, you know, I, I, I wouldn't want to install anything too expensive because, you know, the property isn't worth all that much, and, um, you know, I assume a commercial sprinkler system would definitely... Uh, be a pricey um, expenditure. Yeah, and, and it may or may not. A lot of it depends on how much water, what kind of water supply you have coming in from the street, uh, supplying the domestic, because it and how, what the size of the basement is. Um, all these things pay in a factor. So what we're uh, going to, uh, we're, we will propose to adjourn this case, um, and you can come back and provide us with estimates of what a sprinkler system um, would cost to install in this in, in, in the basement so that it, you can truly demonstrate a hardship. I, you know, it's extra work, but we need to, it's, we hear this all the time, it's too expensive. Well, we don't know what too expensive looks like. And you, so when you come back, we will ask you to bring a bit of uh, sprinkler and also um, what your, your, uh, the, the the property value is not not just the the structure value. You, you also generate business and rents and everything else. So that's part of the value. So we want right. to we'll want to see what the cost of the sprinkler versus this. You may be right. This, this is too expensive. But um, as board, we we want to we want to know what that that difference is. Um, let's see. And um, as in the previous case. Uh, 
we will be looking at a, uh, a commercial uh, fire alarm system that's uh, supervised and monitored um, uh, for, for this, uh, for relief of this variance rather than integrated smoke heat alarms. <laughs> we want something a little bit, something that in the event of a fire that the fire department is, is notified or in the event of the problem with the smoke alarms or the heat alarms, that the system signals the trouble uh, alarm so that somebody can go and fix the system. So we're looking we're, for the standard variances that have been done in these types of situations. Uh, we're asking for more than uh, what's been asked in the, in the past just because of the risk. Uh, while I have you, uh, what is actually stored in the basement? Anything? Furniture, mattresses? Um, no, it's just the furnaces. The, the, no, no, no items, no personal items, uh, some paint cans, um, but it's mostly mechanical gear, like four, four electrical panels, uh, four furnace, or two furnaces, and uh, four hot water tanks. Okay, and does, uh, do you have washers and dryers in the basement? No, I do not. Okay. So, so you have, what type of furnaces do you have, or do you use to heat the building? Is it a large one? Get, is it it's hot a air? air. Is, it's a hot it's air. A forced okay. air. Okay. And um, the, the sanitary and domestic water supplies that go from the basement uh, up into the upper floors, they, they, they just, there's a hole through the cellar floor and, and the pipes pass up through the building. Is that, or are there fire stopping That's, or anything in those areas? Um, I believe, I believe it's holes in the floor, correct? Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Mr. Foster, do you have anything you'd like to speak on this case? It is going to get adjourned and we'll bring it back and have a conversation about it next month after we get some more information. Uh, thank you, sir. I, I do have several concerns um, about this property. Um, one, I'm, I was just aware of the application when it was sent to me by Mr. Detilio. Um, so right off the bat, I have a couple of issues with the uh, owner's application. Um, if you look on page two, if you have it in front of you, uh, and it's yeah. not a, a a big deal, but it just it, it just shows me that the application was filled out incorrectly. Um, I don't use Jerry. That's number one. That's a nickname. Then if you go down to part three on page two of five, you'll see where the owner put down residential R4, which is incorrect. Um, <clears throat> construction type, he didn't put any. Um, so, so again, I'm not going to nitpick, but if you look through the application, the application um, I, I, I can honestly say, I don't believe this application came through me for proof reading before being sent to the, to, uh, Mr. Detilio in Syracuse and then okay. submitted to the board. Um, he claims he's got 6,000 square feet, but according to our city assessor's office, he only has the building when it was built only has, uh, 3,088 square feet of converted apartment <laughs> space and not contributory space of 1,544 square feet. So unless his calculations are, are severely off, um, he's got a whole new building added onto this building, which is built according to the city assessor's office in 1950. And at that time it was built with a gross floor area of 3,088 square feet and two stories. He's claiming in his application that he has now I'm looking at of his application, variance application. I'm looking on page three, uh, part four. He's um, looking for core relief for Title 19 and Part 1225 of the Fire Code. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, again, I'm just a little confused because down below where it says Code Section, we didn't cite Part 1225. We didn't cite Basement. Um, that's not what's on his list of violations. Actually, we have inside cellar stairs from the New York State Multiple Residency Law, Article 3, Section 31. We cite him the inside cellar stairs. According to his application, he's looking for relief for a basement cellar, which once again has not even been cited um, in his list of mm -hmm. violations. 
So um, I'm going to suggest one that uh, we do table it like you guys are doing already and two to have the owner contact me immediately so we can fill out the application properly. I can do a site visit and I can direct him further so that way we can get he can get this right um, because I'm not sure again how this application got past me and went directly to the board. Um, so so that's that's the questions that I have for the owner. Um, we are not in favor. The city is not in favor and we will not support a variance for this particular property at 1211 Lincoln Ave because we believe it's in it's an illegal illegal structure and uh, it's an illegal conversion. Um, once again, it's been documented that it's a two story with attic space, but the owner is claiming he he has an apartment in the attic. He has no means of no. The, the, there's no apartment in the attic. Uh, the the square footage of the living area is correct. That's accurate. Uh, the reason it says six thousand square feet is because I added the attic space and the basement to that, which which is why this it's basically double. And I I guess uh, it okay. was, that was my fault that I that I no, presumed no. that that's that's what it was asking. No. Dimitri, okay. if, if I can call you Dimitri, that, that's fine. So here, here's what I'm going to suggest. When we get off this phone, I will call you and I will further direct you because um, according to your inspection, um, you really don't need to apply for a variance if you only have uh, two apartments in there. Or do you have three apartments? Four. Four. You have four There's apartments. Four. Right. So once again, we're talking about a possible illegal conversion because again, in 1950, when it was built, it was built to only occupy two families. So once again, um, again, I'm not berating you or anything. We just want to make sure we get it right before we send everything to the board of New York State for variance. Because if your building doesn't qualify for variance, then we won't send you to the board. So let, let's let's clarify this after they table this, and I'll give you a call a little bit later this afternoon. Okay. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Thank but you. I, uh, I bought the building with four apartments. I don't I, know. I, I, I kind of knew, knew you were gonna. I knew you were gonna say that because you built. You bought it uh, December thirty first of twenty nineteen. But buying a building as is doesn't mean it's act, It's actually in okay. full compliance. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Okay. So um, this this conversation is outside of the board purview. What I think is clear here is there's some questions on. Um, uh, some the violations and whether this is a legal uh, legal occupancy or not. So for now, uh, we are going to adjourn this case to a later date, and uh, we'll have you come back after uh, the whole case is reviewed to determine if you need a variance. If you need a variance, you can come back. If you don't need a variance, um, and you have some compliance issues that you can work out with the city, then that that will be even better that you don't have to come to variance because you can do it. You know, legally. Um, so let's uh, move to adjourn. I, I'll entertain a motion. I move we adjourn. Okay, Miss uh, Miss Swistak makes a motion to adjourn this case to a later date. Um, do I have a second? Second. Mr. Garlock seconds. Pull the pull the board. Mr. Hinterleiter. Aye. Uh, Miss Swistak. Aye. Mr. Garlock. Aye. And the chair votes ayes. Four ayes, no nays. This case is adjourned to a later date. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, on to our next case. And let me bring it up here. Let's jump from folder to folder. And all right, okay. And we'll now move on to our next case, uh, petition number 2023-0553. This is in the matter of uh, Jasmine Eklagic and KA Rentals uh, for a variance to Chapter 61B of the Consolidated Laws of New York Multiple Residence Law. And uh, the, the applicant is seeking relief of Chapter 61B Multiple Residence Law, Article 3, Section 28, Stairs and Entrance Halls. Also seeking relief, uh, Chapter 61B of Consolidated Laws, New York State, Multiple Residents Law, Article 3, Section 31, Inside Cellar Stairs. 
Um, do we have an applicant here? Do we have a representative of KA Rentals? <laughs> We're not hearing anything. Um, let's see. Mr. Foster, can you share um, until we have an applicant come online? Can you, can you provide some uh, information? Do you have, excuse me, do you have any information that you would reply with, that you would like to state in the matter of this application? Uh, I do. So the city of Utica is in favor of a variance for this particular property, which is located at uh, 331 Genesee Street. It, um, okay, hold on one second. Let me just double check because I have it 332. Yes, it's 331. It's my error. Okay, so it's a, we have a typo error and whatever yes. not. 331. Yes. Okay. Yes. So we are in favor of uh, of a variance for this property. Um, I see on one of the pictures that Mr. Detilio pointed out to me in a previous email um, of the location of the fire rated door. Um, if you look at one of the pictures that's submitted by the, the applicant, uh, he does, he does have 2 fire rated doors at the bottom. Of the basement, he does have upon my inspection, he does have sheetrock on the inside cellar stairwell, but there's not a fire rated door at the landing from that basement, uh, coming up from the basement to the 1st floor landing. Uh, which is where we would like the fire rated door. Um, and then the occupant stated that he would apply for a variance. Uh, this is a 3 story structure, multiple dwelling. Uh, we've, we've, uh, we've really never had any problems during inspections with this particular property and or owner or owners. Um, so we are in favor of any, um, decisions from the board. Okay. Is. Is the basement, uh, how's the basement ceiling protected on this? Uh, the basement ceiling actually is not protected. Uh, the basement ceiling is uh, uh, actually, correction, I misspoke. Um, I did not go in the basement of this one in the actual basement because the violation was only for the fire rated door. So I, need, I only looked from the landing and from mid portion of the steps. When I did my inspection on this particular property, um, and I believe the owner can shed more light because I believe the questions I asked him, uh, was satisfactory at the time when I did my inspection several, uh. A month or several weeks ago, so I do not have that information. I apologize. Okay, did you, you didn't cite them for, cause you didn't inspect the basement. Um. I, so I didn't do the actual full building inspection. I was only brought in for the MRL violation. And that's the only violation that I actually looked at at the time. Um, unfortunately. And what is the hardship for reconstructing the cellar stairs and the hall and, and putting a rated door here? What's from what I remember, um, he just. From what I remember, I believe he says he just didn't want to, uh, I don't want to use the word didn't want to do it, but he thought the, the cost outweighed the, the, the use, um, because of the 2 fire rated doors that's located at the basement floor level. Pretty much he didn't want to put another fire rated door. <clears throat> I believe that was it. Um, and I believe there might've been a, hey, I got notes here. I'm sorry, Mr. Parsons, Mr. Chairman. So I got notes here. Also, the dimensions of the door um, was an issue. Also, he would have had to um, specially ordered a door, which, according to um, him, would have been a lot more money to order a special a special sized door. The dimensions for the door is smaller than a nominal regular door. Okay. I I talked to Mister uh, Ilicek. Yep. And his comment was, is he had decided previously and his solution was to put the two fire doors at the bottom. 
he thought this this had already been resolved yeah, no. and that's why it was installed at the bottom but the whole issue was because 28 and 31 address the same door that's their issue right there of a non combust it's a combustible door leading to a corridor going down to the basement or the stairway okay but he thought he had resolved this by putting the two fire doors downstairs which he could said he bought at home people installed and so he's not here so we don't know what the cost of or well, pretty, well, he told me the door is, is like a six foot high, six foot four high door. Okay. In the existing building, it's like 30 and 29 right. change, something right. like that. Right, it's a smaller door. Door opening. Were the, the two fire doors installed because he thought that would solve it, or did some, did the city say it was okay? Did I believe, according to the conversation I had with him, so is that he decided for that and he installed them. Is he here? I think he's here. Well, I, I don't think the city ever. Well, well, first of all, we would we would never tell anyone to install the doors at the level of the basement because the MRL clearly states it has to be at the landing of the upper floor from the basement. So oh. we would have never told anybody to install a doll down there. At least I wouldn't have. Um, I, I can't account for. It may have been a predecessor. Right. <laughs> <laughs> There were no inspections for that or, or permits. <laughs> um, from what I have in my file, there is no. So normally for the fire rated door, if it's just the MRL inside stairs for fire rated door, we normally don't require them to get a building permit or any type of permit to install the door and the door framing. Um, normally, if they're doing the full variance, which to include all the MRLs or more than just um, the fire rated door, then the city will require the owner to pull any applicable building permits um, for installation. Just typically, if, if, if there's a fire rating that has to be applied, um, the, build, the, the um, code does require a building permit to be issued for it. Okay. So. I'll take a look at that and make sure we implement that in our program. Any anything that relates to separations um, that have to be installed for compliance, that's 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 not a that's not a repair. That's a an alteration that would drive a permit, particularly if the the cost of something like that. Um, uh, I don't. Who uh, I see one number here of, of eight five three three is. I just want to make sure we don't have the applicant sitting here. Um, how do you, Mr. Ilyajek? What is, what is he? Is he here possibly? In my I, I checked the database, and that's not his phone number, so I don't know. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I have a phone number in his application that's different than any of the numbers up here. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think. Uh, well, let me pull. What do you want to adjourn this? I think we need to until we get some, yeah. have the applicant here, mm -hmm. and we do need information. And you'll have to work with the applicant, Mr. Foster, to determine uh, what the appropriate mitigation is. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely, Chairman. And and also, we'd like to know about the basement. Yes. And if yes. the basement ceiling is properly separated, that's a it may be, and that would be that would help us uh, you know move forward on this. I'm I'm. Just, I understand the door issue. If, Absolutely, if that, and and okay. I uh, I apologize. I was remiss on looking at the full entire basement. I do apologize. I it, I would just uh, honestly, I, with this case, so that we don't have a you know come back and visit because we forgot something, that the city um, go through this building um, for MRL compliance um, or or for, or code compliance, just so that we can get that on the table, and if there are. Multiple variances, uh, multiple conditions that need a variance, then we can uh, address them all at once. Absolutely, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. So, um, in the matter of uh, petition two zero two three dash zero five five three, and this is regarding uh, three thirty one uh, Genesee Street, City of Utica, County of Oneida, and K A Rentals. Um, I need a motion to adjourn this to a later date. I'll make a motion to adjourn the case for this date. Okay, Mr. Garlock's making motion to it for the adjournment. A second, Mr. Okay. Hindelider seconds. Uh, Ms. Swistak, uh, so pull the board. Swistak? Aye. Mr. Hindelider? Aye. Mr. Garlock? Aye. 
chair votes aye, four ayes, no nays. This case has been adjourned to a later date. All right. Very right long. We are now going to move into our next case, which is uh, petition number 2023-0552, Roser Development Group. Um, let's see, we got the paperwork here. I am present. All right, let's see. Mr. Roser is present. Let's see. Mr. Graham Roser, okay, I see you're on the screen, so you're here. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, and so this uh, petition pertains to a variance for relief from fire sprinkler system for a two-level restaurant, approximately 8,000 square structure type. B. This is located at 16 Harbor Lock Road, City of Utica, County of Oak. Um, and the relief is seeking uh, relief from the Existing building code 1011.1.1 compliance with Chapter 9 and uh, 19 NICR 1227, the existing building code section 1011.2.1 fire sprinkler system um, are the two variances requested. Okay. Let's uh, hear from the applicant, Mr. Roser. Okay, so uh, everything we put in the application is uh, uh, is thorough and um, and presented to you. So I, I don't have any additional information at this point. Hopefully, what we provided is thorough for to make a decision. Okay, what year was this building constructed, Mr. Roser? Nineteen ninety nine, we believe. Okay. okay, and and what was the use? For the building when it was constructed in 1999? I believe it was built to, to supposed to be a boat house. It's, it's a marina, so a place where people can shower and come and go um, and dock their boat. I don't think it ever happened uh, at all that way. I think right off the bat, it was uh, turned into a restaurant with a previous owner named Dave Morgan. It used to be called Kitties on the Canal. So I don't believe it ever operated as it intended use. Um, but we, again, we're not the owners of it at that point, but that is just my recollection of how the building has been used. Okay. So we, so I guess the question is what was in 1999 when it was permitted, what was the use? Um, and this is probably for the city of Utica. Uh, this is Mr. Foster. Is there somebody else in the city of Utica can provide some insight on this building? What is it? What's occupancy oh. occupancy and use was when it was constructed in 1999? So the 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 applicant is correct. Um, it was used as kind of a a uh, uh, barge canal area where people can uh, stop and take a quick shower, use the bathroom. And then uh, over the years, they've added a um, eatery, if you will, or some type of a, a restaurant. Um, now, this was way before I moved to Utica. Um, the chief building inspector, Danny Colson, knows more about it, but unfortunately, he's unavailable to uh, to join us on this particular uh, WebEx. Um, um, so even when I asked Mr. Colza, um, what the previous use was, um, we have sketchy information, um, and I don't know why we do, but again, this building was built before I even moved to Utica. Um, so asking all those questions, uh, we get the same answer as it was what I stated previously, what it was used for, and now it's a full-fledged restaurant. Before the current owners took possession of the building, it was Aquavino Restaurant. So the use hasn't changed, but the space might be changing. Um, the owner can elaborate, elaborate, elaborate. Excuse me, a little bit more on that. Um, but that's why we're here. So, so, so the city and the owner are kind of at a standstill because we're asking for um, certain provisions by the New York State Fire Code, um, and the owner uh, has a little difference of opinion. Um, 
but we're willing to work with the owner in any uh, capacity to 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 keep their restaurant uh, either flourishing and or to um, to make their restaurant bigger, if you will. If that answers your question. Yeah, it does. Um, in 1999, um, looking at the space, um, there's pictures that have been submitted as far as exhibit A and B. It's as clearly as over 50 people on each level. It looks like probably 75 or maybe even over 100. Again, we're just going by pictures. Um, this would have been required to be sprinklered as an assembly occupancy at the time of construction or at the time of change of use. So it's, <clears throat> I'm trying to understand how we got from 1999 to 2023. And uh, city, the city's building permits um, would, and, and what was on your records would certainly be very helpful. Mr. Chairman, uh, you yes. are correct. You are correct in your assessment of the property. Um, what I've been told about that specific comment that you just made uh, is correct, and I agree with you. I was told by um, several members of the city, uh, including um, the mayor and Danny Colza, that when I believe the mayor at the time was Ed Hanna, um, the bottom line is they just didn't want to put in a sprinkler system, meaning the city. The city owned the building. They just didn't want to put in a sprinkler system, um, and that's where we are today. That's why we're having the issue that we're having now. Um, because back in 1990, when it was built, uh, they should have put, the city should have put or installed uh, a sprinkler system for this particular property based off of the square footage and the occupancy load that it can handle. Um, that was never done. Um, the current occupancy is uh, no more than 49 on each level, currently uh, posted by myself. And um, that's where we are now. The occupant, excuse me, the owner, if you look at, if you look at uh, exhibit B, and I believe you have three photos of exhibit B, there's that back wall, excuse me, correction, there's that back window area um, that the current owners would like to add a deck to the back of that and then, excuse me, attach a deck, elevated deck to the back of this space where you see those windows and then open up these windows. They already um, do open. They already do open, that, that is correct, um, but the problem is they go nowhere. So, so there's no increase of occupancy currently right now if you open those windows. If the, the owner adds a deck to that, um, they're going to increase their occupancy. Um, and as such, the city um, has requested that they put in a sprinkler system because of the increase in occupancy, potential occupancy. Now, um, if they keep the restaurant currently as it is with the current occupancy load, the city has, has no problem with them doing that. But again, they're looking for expansion um, for future business, which which we 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 agree on that. Um, and if you look at a letter from a Phil 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 Barra, and if I'm saying this wrong, Sabara, uh, Sabara, because um, we did ask this, the owners of Portofino to look into a sprinkler system, and this is their architects rendition of why they not why they can't put in a sprinkler system but uh why they shouldn't put in a sprinkler system because of their reasons so that's when we apply for the variance we're looking for direction from the board uh to assist us in assisting the owner with either expansion and or occupancy um direction if you will and I did provide information on the cost of a sprinkler system and the hardship it causes to put that in, which it cannot be put in because the water line the city built the building with can is a two inch line. And so 
already from starting from there, we don't, uh, the building doesn't have the water line capacity. And then I did price out a sprinkler system like you've asked prior uh, applicants to do, and I did provide that. And it is very expensive to do that. Plus, in order to do some of the construction, Mr. Chairman, they would, not that it would be a, a, a huge issue, but the owners of Portofino would have to, um, they would have to get direction from the barge canal um, uh, powers that be, the authority to do any work near near the canal. Um, who owned, so when the building was constructed, who owned the building? Uh, the city of Utica. And the, and the city sold the building to Mr. Roser, or is there another party that owned so it? So the city, the city leased the building to Rob, Robert Esch, and Robert Esch owned uh, Aquavino Restaurant, then Mr. Um, then the current owners took possession of the the building from the city. They kept the contract with Mr. Ash until his contract expired recently, and now um, they own the current owners own all rights and all space to that building. Is there a certificate of compliance or a certificate of completion on this building uh, from? Initial construction. I do not know. I would have to ask uh, my counter partner, Danny Colza. Um, I'm not familiar with. I haven't seen any of that, but I'm pretty sure Danny has a record of it. Okay. Certificate. Um, I believe Mr. Parsons, this is Tom DiTulio. I contacted the billing department for the city of Utica and asked for plans. When it was converted from the hospitality center to the restaurant, and there are no plans have been provided to me. There was none available at the time, and they had uh, difficulty finding them. Hmm. Don't believe there's a layout for anything. <laughs> there's no certificate. Uh, I asked for all documentation. I received nothing. Um, so I can, I can honestly say that when, when, uh, Rob Ash had the. The restaurant, I believe Mr. Colza did issue a certificate. Of, uh, of occupancy. Of CFC, um, I, I don't have that in my office because we don't keep it. We don't keep the CFCs here in my office. We want to keep the certificate of compliance code compliance in my office. Um, so I, I. Tom, I'll reach out to Danny and see if I can get something for you and submit it to the board, or I'll see if I can find something for you. Okay. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Foster. You're very welcome. Is the Ms. stairwell rated? I'm sorry, say again? Is the stairwell rated, and does it have an area of refuge? Because I don't see any handicapped exit off of the stairwell either. So, um, let me look at the pictures. So the question to that is the fire, the stairwells to the far left and to the far right are fire rated. And the only um, access is that there's a ramp to the, uh, unfortunately, the pictures that I have really doesn't show it. Um, Miss, Mr. Roser, you, you can chime in here anytime. Right. So there in, in the back of the building on the promenade by the dock. There's a ramp. There's a loading road. They, they, yeah, there's a loading driveway. There's a ramp that you can that's accessible right. handicapped. So there is ways. For people who are handicapped to exit the building from the basement or from the stairwell. So a handicapped person can't get to this floor. Which, which floor, ma'am? Yeah, which floor? The first floor, the second. The floor, the floor above above grade or below grade. The second floor where you want to put the deck. Yes, there's an elevator in the building. Yes, and we have an elevator. That's correct. If you look at the one of the pictures in um, Exhibit B, uh, I wouldn't name the B1, B2, and B3, but unfortunately we we can't do that right now. If you look at one of the pictures in Exhibit B, um, you can see the elevator to the right, the elevator shaft. On the right hand side of one of the um, pictures labeled B, and then there's another picture labeled Exhibit B, where you can see the elevator shaft to the to the left, and then the other picture you can see the elevator shaft to the right. It's 
enclosed in a um, uh, tan or cream colored wall. You should be able to see the elevator. Okay. So when was that elevator added? We have some drawings that uh, Ms. Swistek has are from 1999 that do not show an elevator in that building. So what documentation does the city have for the elevator? I'm ashamed to say, I don't know, and I don't think we have any. But if the um, building was built with an elevator shack because all the drawings that came from the uh, from, from the engineering company has the elevator shaft in there because we've had to look at them before. So those drawings from Mr. Grozier, those original documents he had, these sir? Yes. But they changed somewhere. And if the handicapped person was out there, they've got to go back into the building and then to the stairwell where no. May or may not have an area of refuge. No, on the top floor, ma'am, there is a there is two exits to leave the building. On the top floor, on top of a stairwell, fire rated stairwell. Okay. Oh, great. Okay. Good. Right, but but in their handicap, they've got to go back, back the into the building. That's correct. And then to to the rated stairwell. That's correct. Or out the front door. Or out the front door or the side door. That's a that's but not if they're on the second floor. Yes. Yes. On the second okay. floor, there are three exits. There they're is both a, a grade. A front no, okay. This is this okay. is a grade and then downstairs. Oh, that's right. Okay, I got it. Right. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. So speaking for myself, Mr. Parson speaking up, I think where I'm stopped at is trying to find out or trying to understand without documentation how and when this building was determined to be legally constructed and legally occupied. Um, certificate occupancy is one thing, but you know, I'm looking at a, an A occupancy built within um, the last 20 years huh? or occupied in the last 20 years. It doesn't have a fire sprinkler system in an assembly occupancy. There is no variance for the prop for the property that that's been presented. There's no so, I, and I understand the city owned it, but the city is still required to comply with the code at the time, and so it should even even following the requirements that the state had for code enforcement. Even as a building owner, it still was required to produce a legally occupiable building that apparently that sold, and so I I'm trying I. For us to even talk about variance on an addition when we don't know whether the building is legally and compliant with the code of the day when it was constructed or current codes leaves us without enough information, leaves me without enough information to vote uh, in support of a variance. And uh, you know whether you get a variance or not, it, the same question goes back to the city. Um, Chairman, Mr. The, Chairman, I'm sorry. Go, I'm getting a lot of feedback. I can hardly hear you. I mean, a lot of people talking. I, I can't hear you, sir. Kevin Fast needs to put himself on mute. He just joined the meeting. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Mr. My Chairman. apologies. Okay. Yeah, we just had, I'm sorry, Mr. Foster. We had some people join in and uh, they were unmuted. So can you hear me okay? I can, sir. Thank you. Okay. So for me, speaking for myself, I can't vote or even consider a variance on this with, uh, for this property when I don't know whether this building was uh, constructed legally and occupied legally. Um, and even if it had got a CO, which somebody said there was a CO, um, I still have a hard, hard time understanding how this building wasn't sprinklered uh, when it was first turned into a restaurant. And, and part of that may be the municipal Entity that owned it um, didn't enforce the code on itself. I, I don't know. I'm, it's purely speculative, and so I'm trying to understand where we need to take it. Because overall, you have a building that doesn't have a sprinkler system that has an assembly occupancy that really should be dealt with first, relative to any variances that it might need because of hardships and what mitigations could be put in place for it. 
something that it should have received back in the in 1999 or 2000 or whenever it was converted. Um, these things should have been done back then and, and probably, you know, but so unfortunately we're gonna have to unwind a little history and, and find out what's there. Um, what, who's the, do we have an architect or, or Mr. Rose, do you have an architect um, that you've hired to do a code analysis of this building? Cause that would be incredibly helpful to find out and I'm talking about more than a letter from Mr. Spara. Um, I think we really need to go back and do a code analysis on this building and, and maybe Mr. Barr can do a, a life safety and a, and a building code analysis at the time of construction and the best a little bit of history lesson to find where things are. And then we can apply all the variances that need to be applied on the building as it stands without an addition and then we can talk about the addition. Does that make sense? That makes sense yeah, to me. That, that's gonna, so wouldn't the city have to produce? I mean, it was their building. And so this architect is a is a, someone I have to pay for to do work like that. When again, this building, shouldn't that something the city should be able to provide? Because when I bought the building, the city had no problem coming in and slapping a 60 page code violation on me that the building had to then be brought up to codes by the landlord tenant who was Mr. Esch. So the city right. is fully aware of what codes were not going on in that building. Is that something that they could provide? At my knowledge right now, that building is completely up to codes. It has a CO that I've gotten from the city for upstairs and downstairs. Um, and uh, there is no code violation that we know of at all with it because it is all to codes. So I'm sort of lost at what what else we would have to do because I'm I'm complying to everything the city has asked me to do, even when they sold me a building that wasn't compliant. Okay. But I mean, I want this to be helpful, and I'm trying to provide as much information as possible. Right. But I, you know, I really don't, you know, I guess I'm in a very bad situation, or or just a very uncomfortable situation because I, I'm. Now a victim, which is not good. I I understand, uh, but we also you were asking for a variance on a, on a building that we have we've asked questions about and haven't got any answers to because visually with the pictures and with the information that's provided to us raises question whether this is a legal building, and and it's only a question and it, the city of Sir, city of Utica has not been able to answer that question, so. We can go on one, we could go to one of two paths and I think we're going to take a few minutes and go and do some deliberation. But the paths I see forward are adjourn till we get more information and then figure out what needs to be done Agreed. on this application. Or two is we just deny the application and send you back and you can work with the city on whatever needs to be done because frankly, it's their requirements to enforce the code and, and not ours. You're asking us. For a variance, and I'm I'm saying, speaking for myself, as one vote on this board, that I cannot vote uh, to grant a variance, vote for a variance for this building when I have concerns about or questions. It is concerns, but questions about its occupancy and its fire, its fire and its life safety components that are appear to be lacking. So um, I'll leave I'll leave it at that. Um, Anybody else on the board have want us to make any statements regarding this? Again, we, we, we're trying, what would be helpful is if there's, if we look at the building as a whole and there's, there's stuff that needs to be done, it would be good to know what those are. And, and obviously there is some hardships because of the situation and we can look at what a, a variance on the entire occupancy would look like. All right, so you'd but, like me to ask Mr. Sabara to put a life, what plan is it called again, a life what? You're going to do a code analysis inspection and a life safety inspection. Yeah, code analysis and a life safety inspection. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll yeah, call and, you. Mr. Roser, you can. This is Tom Dupuy. You can contact me, and I can contact your architect or okay. engineer, and we can review what's needed along with Mr. Foster. Okay. Okay. Yep, we, we can go ahead and do that. I, I was, again, Mr. Uh, Rose is speaking for myself. I I am in agreement with Mr. Foster. We want to make sure that your business continues, your accuracy continues. However, there are some life safety concerns here that 
need to be answered, questions need to be answered and may need to be addressed through, you know, a variance that's more uh, expansive than what you're asking for. You're asking for an addition on something that, on a building that may not be legally compliant. Right. And, and the city so far has not been able to answer those questions and you've not been able to provide us information, as you said, hard to get information out of the city. So um, I will leave it to Mr. Tertullio to go back and have a conversation. Speak, again, speaking for myself, I suspect my colleagues may be in the same boat. We're trying to figure out a way to make this work for you and for the city of Utica. But most importantly, we wanna make sure we have a safe occupancy for, for people that are visiting this facility um, and using it as a gathering place, uh, either a restaurant or a wedding banquet or whatever it may be used in the future, okay? Okay. All right, so, um, let me let's I think what we're going to do is take a few minutes and uh, we're going to go into recess to do a little bit of deliberation and just in case we have more information we want to send back. Um, okay. Okay. So, yes. All right. So, and then when we come back, we'll have, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but we want to make sure we do make sure we get everything down of what we're looking for. Okay. So I'm, uh, I'd like to go into recess. Uh, Maureen. Um, we're going to go into deliberation for about five minutes and go off the record. The record. Okay, we have a couple of people. We're on the record. I want to thank everybody for their patience while we were uh, deliberating on this case. Um, I think uh, we are going to move to adjourn this case, um, uh, waiting for um, additional information. Um, the additional information. Um, that we feel that we need to uh, move forward on this application is a code review for life safety issues um, related to uh, initial construction and the change of use and occupancy uh, as a restaurant um, from 1999 through uh, today. Um, we, uh, we feel that there's just, uh, there, there's, from our code analysis, excuse me, from our staff uh, review of this case, it appears there's a lot of information that's not available, and uh, and I'm not sure why it's not available from the city of uh, Utica. Uh, also, in addition to that, for the record, um, I've asked Mr. Tertullio, um, and this is from the board, we're asking that the Department of State Building Standards and Codes Oversight Division um, take a look at this case and the documents and records that the city of Utica has related to this building. Um, and it's uh, at the time of construction and um, subsequent annual inspections as a restaurant, certificates of occupancy and permits, assembly permits that are required um, uh, through today. Um, so we, we just feel that based on the staff analysis that there's, there's a lot of holes here. And so, uh, hopefully the oversight division can help close some of those gaps as well. So, um, Mr. Rosa, um, Mr. Detulio will uh, be in contact with you about what, what a code review and safety analysis is. This is done by a design professional, uh, a licensed architect or an engineer um, with experience with um, the building codes and standards um, in, in, in building construction. So um, your your architect may be capable of doing this. I, I don't know and may be willing to do this, but we do need that information for us to move forward on this variance. Um, and again, I think what we're goal is to get to a point where this building, if there are gaps prior to this variance application that need to be addressed, those gaps can be addressed um, either through uh, bringing the building into compliance or variances that it may, may need to bring the building into compliance and with mitigations, of course, it's just not, we're not going to take a building that's non-compliant, say it will make it compliant. There has, we have to make sure that all the aspects of life safety are covered, that there are adequate mitigations to uh, make up for things that are not currently present in the building. So that that's where we're at. So Mr. Uh, Rosa, do you have any questions for us? No, I do not. Um, 
seems like an awful lot of can of worms that got open from from this meeting. So I hope uh, I hope we can resolve this and get it fixed. I hope so too. Uh, Mr. Foster, do you have any questions for the board? Do not. I want to thank the board for the direction, and uh, I will reach out to Mr. Dettilio and stay in contact with uh, Grant Roser and his dad Ken, and we'll uh, make sure that uh, we get the the building. Excuse me, the uh, board anything and everything they they need to make a dis an adequate decision, and uh, I will get as much information from the city, or the departments. As I can on this and refer it all to Mr. Detilio. And I look okay. forward to the code review and the safety analysis by a design professional. Very good. Okay. So I need a motion. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I was just heading that. I just need a motion for to to uh, adjourn this case to a later date. I'll make that motion. Standard Lighter makes the motion to adjourn uh, this case to a later date, any more information. Uh, do I have a second? I second. Ms. Swistak seconds. Uh, poll the board. Mr. Garlock? Aye. Ms. Swistak? Aye. Mr. Indelighter? Aye. Chair votes aye. Four ayes, no nays. This case is adjourned. Good luck. Thank you. I want to thank the board. I think that's my last hearing. I want to thank the board. Uh, see you next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Because our next case is 20230559, it's in the city of Syracuse. Ms. Swistak is going to recuse herself. Okay. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Do we have a, any other? Do we have another board member from outside sitting in on this case? I don't believe so. Okay. All right. Moving on to our next case. Oops. Okay, our next case is in the uh, matter of petition 2023-0559. Um, this is uh, for, uh, the applicant is uh, Pete Sala, Vice President for Syracuse University. And this pertains to the JMA, JMA Wireless Dome located at 900 Irving Avenue, City of Syracuse County, Vondaga, New York State. Public notice was published in the New York State Registers November 8, 2023. Um, the petitioner is seeking relief from 19 NYCRR Part 1221, uh, the 2020 Building Code of New York, Section 907.2.1.3 Automatic Smoke Detection System, which states a uh, smoke detection system that activates the occupant notification system in accordance with Section 905.7 shall be installed in Group A occupancies unless the air, fire area is protected with an automatic fire sprinkler system that it activates the occupant notification system in installed in accordance with section 903.3.1.1. And the petitioner is seeking relief for a variance to allow visual image flame detection system in lieu of uh, a sensor or beam detection system in the event, in the event arena area. Okay, do we have an applicant here? Hey, uh, good morning. I, um, my name is Andrew Oliver, uh, architect with Populous. I'll be, we've got, we've got a number of members from our team here, um, that, uh, okay. I'll, I'll be, excuse me. Yeah. Andrew, we have your spelling. Could you just give us your address? Absolutely. I am at 4,800 Main Street, uh, Kansas City, Missouri. Okay. So you have a, who else? Me. Who else will be speaking, or who else do you want to be speaking? So we'll get the interview. Absolutely. Yeah. We um, uh, for the rest of our team, uh, Kevin Fast is is with us. Sean Monkey, they're also with Populous Architects. Um, Brian Lanzi uh, with ME Engineers. He's an electrical engineer. Uh, Jeremy Kyling is here, um, a mechanical engineer. He's also with ME Engineers. And then Syracuse University has. Uh, Jennifer Bybee here as a representative. Okay. All right. When they speak, we'll just have to have them state their name and their address. Okay. So that sounds okay. good. Mr. Oliver, go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Thanks everyone for getting us on the agenda pretty quickly here. Um, so I wanted to thank everyone for that. Um, 
our project is real. The, the whole point of the project for here at the JMA Dome is really just a number of life safety upgrades. Uh, we are doing a number of items that the dome was built kind of finished around 1980. Um, we are replacing seats throughout the dome, removing the bench seating, replacing with uh, individual seats. We're lowering the occupant load uh, over by over 6,000. We are widening the aisles. There was a recent item with, with the aisles. Um, so that there's a number of railing upgrades, replacements. Um, we are extending sprinkler coverage to a number of areas. It's mostly the concourses and areas of seating that have uh, the bowl above it. So um, really, the, oh, and, and excuse me, probably most importantly is uh, we're adding a smoke evacuation system um, for the whole building. <clears throat> so this is tied into that to really uh, give that not, o occupant notification for the bowl area. Uh, this, you know, there's an exception uh, that's being used to, to not sprinkle the bowl area. It's over, the roof is over 50 feet. Uh, above the field level, so it's it's, it's impractical. Um, but we are yeah proposing and uh, seeking a variance here um, for the uh, detection item for that bowl area. <laughs> and uh, as you mentioned, yeah, we're we're seeking to use a um, kind of infrared uh, fire, excuse me, flame detection camera. Uh, we've included some information on that. Um, so that that's our form of heat, uh, excuse me, fire detection in lieu of automatic smoke detection. <laughs> okay. Um, we have there's some more info in the in kind of the the letter uh, exhibit there, but we have explored a number of other options before kind of arriving to this one. Uh, beam detection, uh, air aspiration systems like FES. Um, and uh, video smoke detection, and uh, for various reasons, we um, we can get into those if, if you'd like. But uh, we really have kind of landed on this one as being the, the best option for the dome, the existing conditions, um, how these cameras are mounted, how they you know the distances we're dealing with, um, and maintenance is also a, a huge item. Now with, with any fire alarm system uh, being able to test, maintain, access these items uh, is a huge component of this. <laughs> okay. Um, let me just uh, ask my colleagues, do you have any questions? I have, I have a couple questions on this, but do you have any? You're the fire expert. <laughs> All right. uh, and I don't know, Mr. Oliver, if you're the best person to answer this question, but I do have a question related to what was the what was the factor that made you chose um, uh, the flame detection versus VSD? So yeah, excuse me. So video smoke detection. We the issue we ran into there was lighting conditions. The the dome uh, has kind of a translucent uh, film. It lets in a lot of daylighting. We we did explore that. But we uh, ran into issues with that one that it would be really that the lighting conditions of the dome, it would be constantly false alarming um, the way that that uses kind of a video technology. Did that, was that a, an opinion from the design personnel or was that design opinion from the manufacturer? Manufacturers mostly, yeah. What what was the translucent light? Or is it from spotlights? Is that what you're suggesting that was going to be the triggering falses? That's more the the material. Excuse me, of the roof itself uh, has kind of a diamond um, uh, material that's lighting in a lot of daylight, and they would also would, you know, for some of the events that that happens at the dome, and, and sometimes there's there's just not a lot of light. Uh, you know, maybe you know a dark concert or something, um, where that that type of technology just wouldn't be helpful. You know, it wouldn't provide the notification. Yeah, I think from I, I understand the concern for the false alarms because I know that in open atriums where there's a lot where sunlight gets in, that can be a problem. Um, but in cl closed spaces, I'm, I've not seen that situation, so okay. um, I'm not aware of falsing. I know that I've had um, I've had experience in, a, in three different installations, uh, two successful, one not, um, mainly due to, to outside lighting because there was clear glazing. 
Um, so one piece that I know that you know the technology is can be fine tuned, but the the advantage of VSD is the, mm -hmm. the ability to detect the plume, particularly if you're coming out from underneath the concourse areas, um, where the flame detectors are only going to pick up a pretty high heat, and if you don't have a place where the heat's accumulated, it's going to it's going to diffuse, and you may not get active triggers. It'll be a late trigger. Sure. And, and a side note for for those concourse areas, they will have all sprinkler protections being added to those, and they'll have flow detectors. So, um, just a side note there. Yeah. What about uh, what about detection, uh, whether a Vesta system or some other detection underneath the concourse area? Because looking at models and and sports events where they've done testing for for detection, uh, flame and smoke and plumes. Um, it, it, it definitely the problem hazard areas is under the concourse, and so if we're if we're waiting for heat, heat's going to disperse quite broadly. Where smoke can get funneled because it's a you know it's a denser and can move. I'm more cons interested in knowing how 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 the video works under the concourse because I my I, I do, I've looked at the I looked at information mm -hmm. from like. I, I, it's great for around the perimeter where you can see, but underneath where you can't see, I, I don't know that it ad adequately uh, covers those areas. So, well, I apologize, but uh, you, so our, our method of detection for for the concourse, excuse me, will, will be the sprinkler system. If there's a fire anywhere on the concourse, we um, are using the, the sprinkler system to uh, detect that and trigger and, and then it will initiate you know notification also but the flow detectors will, will do that the entire concourse. I apologize. Andrew, 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 can I speak for a second? This is Pete Sala. Okay, so before you talk, I, state, state your name and your address and yep. we'll go. My name's Pete Sala, uh from Syracuse University, nine hundred Irving Ave, uh, Syracuse, New York. Andrew, the, the concourses are being fully brought to code, sprinkled and detected. So there'll be smoke detectors through the entire facility where currently there wasn't before. So the entire venue is being brought up to code. This camera system is just for the bowl in the yeah, area. Just for the field seating areas. That's correct. I wanted to just make that clear. I'm I'm sorry, sir. No, that's very helpful. I it wasn't I, I, I know that she Mr. Yes. Stella it's okay. speaking before. Sorry, this is Maureen, the reporter. Was that Mr. Sella speaking? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I know that that was a concern that we received in communication from uh, Chief Davis from the Syracuse Fire Department. Um, wanted to make sure that there was actually detection um, in the concourse area. Are, are you doing spot detectors in the concourse area? Are you doing a VESDA system? What are you doing? What's what's your protection in those areas? It's the excuse me. It's the the flow detectors. Um, in the in the sprinkler system, excuse me, uh, Brian or or uh, excuse me, Jeremy, would you be able to speak a little further to that? Excuse me, what, flow detectors. Help me. I, I don't know what you're talking about. No, there there's Andrew. There's it's a it's a full smoke detector system. Yeah, yeah. You're referring to the activation when it's when yeah. a when a sprinkler goes off. Obviously, the fire alarm will right. detect that. But we are putting. A, a full detector system in there, smoke detectors from the entire concourse, okay. and all the restrooms and every, every part of the facility. And with this, there's a, a full smoke evacuation system being installed in the facility through the entire concourse area to allow egress with no smoke. Okay. That so so you're doing spot detectors and and is that's what you're okay? Thank you. So. I know that during concerts and other events, um, quite often haze is used and or fog machines or think uh, uh, event you know things that actually happen out the floor. Um, do, is there going to be a, a policy where if there's a concern that that the smoke or the haze gets into the concession areas or the you know underneath the the, the decks that you won't trigger false alarms? So the, the the building fire alarm system is actually the activation system, the full fire panel is programmed as such and is written in code that the Syracuse Fire Department is at all those events that 
those types of things happen. And the, okay. the, the panel is able to go into what's called an event mode. And the fire department is staffed in the command center and throughout the building, no less than a dozen officers there for a concert or a major event like that. And they control the activation um, when, the, when there is detection from those types of situations. Okay. Thank you. That's and, and there's a plan that the city is a part of. Yes, sir. It's a written policy. That, All right. Um, every event that we do at the facility, the fire department comes in and does a, a, a walk through of the entire building, regardless of the event. And if we, if we have a minimum of at least four on standby every event that there could be possible evacuation. Okay. All right. Um, before um, let me open this up to the city of Syracuse. Uh, I see Chief Davis is here. Do you, look, do you have anything you'd like to add to the? Yes. Okay. Come forward. Let's make sure. Uh, Elton Davis, E L T O N D A V I S, Deputy Chief, Syracuse Fire Department, uh, Fire Prevention Bureau. Address 300 South State, 300 One Park Place, 300 South State Street, 13202. Okay, Mr. Chief Davis, go ahead. Yes, Chairman and the board. I just, again, I, I agree a lot of the information that was shared by Mr. Saller and some in the uh, in the uh, design staff. We are we are are in re reviewing the fire alarm, the fire alarm system, the, the un, under the concourse, there is there is detection, there is suppression under in, the, in all those concourse areas. They have have complied with that. Put that proposal together to have that uh, have that installed. And again, we do have Syracuse Fire Department does have staff there for for the events. We we do man the we do man the command center, and in the event for you know activation and sending individuals out. My initial concern with uh, and I supplied a supplied something to to the board just for consideration. You know, we acknowledge that the university is seeking relief to allow. The uh, video type throne detection device to be used as as part of the building smoke control system. You know the 2020 building, building code section 909.12 requires that fire detection system provide control input or output signals for the mechanical smoke control systems or elements thereof shall comply with the requirements in section 907. And um, you know it also also says that it has to comply with UL 80. UL-864 has listed smoke control to smoke control equipment. Uh, section 907 2.1.3 goes on to read that a smoke detection system is required. My, again, I, I understand the concept that's going behind what they're trying to achieve. I, I just couldn't make the step for we're using a for smoke control system, what we're using to activate that system is flame. And I understand where, you know, on the, you know, we're on, we're in the bowl piece and that, and these are hypotheticals and this is somehow how the fire department, you know, we pre-plan and try to think of the worst case scenarios. But in my estimation, there could be an event or something that would occur in that bowl area where the, Flame could not be detected. Again, we have stages on on the floor, stages, trailers, things like that. There are some underground conduit or things that run along the floor to dome that, in essence, could create a smoke condition, but without having visible flame that would be perceptible by that by that detection that device. And again, I know we have a lot of things in in place here. Like you said, the manpower, the other the other systems in there. It was just my that 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 system that was proposed didn't meet that section of the code that I was, and I was looking for some guidance from the state. You know, the the design team, SU design team, that provided a lot of information, interesting information, valuable information. Just as a, as a representative from the city, I. Just couldn't make that step because I had not a lot of background with this type of system, and nor does the code give me 
give me that latitude to say that I can accept a visual device, visual flame detection device in lieu of a smoke detector. So that, that why, and again, we have no city of Syracuse, you know, so if the board finds that their flame detection devices are equally effective as a smoke control, we will as equally, excuse me, as equally effective as smoke detection devices, you know, we don't object to using those detectors, but we do have a few things that we wanted to make sure was in place. You know what I mean? Just to make sure that any blind spots from the flame detection, you know, that it would, that, uh, must be provided with smoke detection devices, and that that is accomplished by having those spot detections under the concourse and with the with the uh, sprinkler system on there. And you know that the system be maintained in operational good working order, and that the system is subject to testing on intervals. You know, specific with the code and FPA and any other standards that might apply. And I know some of there are some specific testing requirements that are involved with that system but those only list using smoke, you know, using smoke as a trigger. Mm -hmm. And I, that would be a question that we would like to pose to, to the design team to how will you meet those, those testing requirements using a flame and the code calls for, calls for testing to be done with, with smoke. Anything else? Uh, I have nothing else to add. Okay. Well, just I, and we also have our plan review, building plan reviewer Curtis Harris is here. Curtis Harris, Harris from the city of Syracuse. Syracuse, Syracuse uh, Fire Prevention Bureau. At at uh, Real Walk Place, three hundred uh, South State Street, Syracuse, New York, fifteen o two. Just want to underscore. They and I am not an engineer, but um, the concern that we had that if you should decide to give relief, one of the concerns is that if if we are in fact uh, going uh, according to the commission and testing of the system, it might require a different mission in the testing because of the flame uh, designation versus smoke, and so we need to to know. If, 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 if relief is granted, we need to know if we'll be following manufacturers' recommendations and suggestions the ahead of time, or if we would be trying to help them uh, comply with what's uh, the testing and commissioning in the code, which might not be possible. So with the relief, we should have an idea as to what standard, whether it's manufacturer recommendation, Otherwise, that we would be following if we went down that path. Thank you. Excuse me, was that Mr. Davis speaking? That was Mr. Ayers. Could you just state your name? Curtis Harris, C U R T I S H A R R I S, Syracuse Fire Prevention Bureau. Thank you. Harris. Okay. Okay, uh, triggered some additional questions. Uh, first of all, the code recognizes that in certain conditions, a smoke detector is not the best device for detection. And I'll give you an example, which is I'm gonna go to Mr. Oliver here in a second, because I have a question for him. Um, in a large space like the dome, you can have a fire producing smoke, but it never gets to the ceiling. It, you have inversions, which is they should they they should have a model of whatever uh, whatever for the smoke control system being able to to move smoke out of the space. So sometimes you have to go with whatever the model says. And um, the, I asked Mr. Oliver about the question about uh, uh, visual smoke detection, which is actually detecting a plume actually sees and shapes and sees heat, sometimes that's that's better of identifying it. But as he, he mentioned, it can cause false alarms, certainly in the middle of the night or in the weekend, 
you don't want to be chasing a lot of false alarms when there are no events there. So, but you did bring up a good question, which was what happens if there's something under a stage, which is not detected, doesn't have smoke detection, mm -hmm. and um, might take some time to generate enough heat to be picked up visually by the flame detectors. So, uh, uh, Mr. Oliver, Sir. heard my questions and responses to Chief Davis. How, how, yes. how might you help me understand? So you're right, where there a smoke control rational analysis has been performed. Unfortunately, Stephen isn't here to, to speak to that, but uh, um, I believe they modeled that and they modeled it off of, a, I believe, uh, um, Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, like a 10 megawatt fire, you know, a very large fire. And it was still able to demonstrate oh, that you, on, excuse me. Hold on. I, I, I'm now I'm now you've triggered my how did you come to the rationalization of a 10 megawatt fire when there's clearly more than 10 megawatts underneath a, a, a stage or when you have a monster truck show out there that's clearly more than 10 megawatts so I guess I'm, I, I was curious where you got in the rationale rational I'd have to dig it they, they do have some rational ration you know for that and and uh but that's that's kind of what the the model you were referencing was based off of to demonstrate that everyone was able to you know safely exit the building in the time uh, we need uh, based off of that fire. Um, I apologize. I can try to. I've got that kind of handy here. I can relay some of the rational for how they got to that fire size. But okay. Um, I mean, re relative as, as a, a five megawatt fire is a couch and, and, a, and you know a, re a, res a residential couch and a, a recliner. I apologize yeah. to interrupt. Yeah, could be using the incorrect units. Ten kilowatt fire. Oh, um, which is smaller than a megawatt. No, I'm yeah. sorry. It, it's ten megawatt. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Sorry, that's Brian Brian Lanzi, ME Engineers. Um, okay. Hold hold on a second, Brian. Uh, Brian, I just want to make sure, Maureen, could you state your address? Yes, sir. Uh, 14143 Denver West Parkway, um, Suite 300, and that is Golden, Colorado, 80401. And who do you represent, Mr. Lansy? Uh, ME Engineers. Okay. Yeah. So, right. I. You know, I didn't write this smoke report, but we're reading it right now. And um, the fire size that they used to model was a 10 megawatt fire. And it is based on historical fire data uh, with fuel loads for, for this type of facility, such as, uh, you know, sporting events, basketball, football, um, concert events, uh, festivals, and, uh, uh, let's see, yeah, rodeo, motocross, monster trucks, that kind of thing. So that's that's where the ten megawatt came from. Okay. Well, I'm going to leave that. To, I'm going to leave that to the city of Syracuse to determine whether ten megawatt was adequate enough. Yes, sir. Yeah. For design, when you mentioned monster trucks, because I've seen monster trucks there, mm -hmm. if one of those things catches on fire. I I assure you, it's more than ten megawatts. Yeah. Yeah. So so. But that goes to the smoke control system, and I'm really not worried about the big fires because I think your flame detectors will probably pick them up but if you have them aimed in, in the bowl area. And you can, you can adjust them and make sure that's accommodated. Now, certainly the city of Syracuse can work, will we'll give you some guidance about one of their concerns. I'm more interested in the smaller fire or fire that starts small, that's not in visual range, the stage and how is that going to be detected because if that catches on fire it may produce a lot of smoke for a period of time before it actually erupts into open flame so uh, what 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 enough what engineering solutions have you su suggested well if there are we any. are you know we are not trying to protect or sense every fire in this hole the whole point of the flame detection, smoke detection, is to initiate occupant no notification to begin that process of evacuation um, to start people. So they're moving and out of that that uh, that building before the smoke was to accumulate to a point where it would impact 
people's evacuation. Okay. And that is that is the sole purpose of this flame detection system. So you did evacuation model on this? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. They determined that uh, we needed to be able to, you know, um, to see a fire 100 megawatts, uh, sorry, 10 megawatts uh, or greater. Um, and that within a hundred seconds. Okay. So there's a, there's a good amount of time before that smoke would be accumulating to the point where it would impact people's ability to evacuate. hundred seconds. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and that all, that's all in the smoke model report. Um, so now we go back to this question. How does the flame detectors, if we have smoke in the open area, is the hundred seconds still applicable? Well, we've, you know, as a design team and with the manufacturer's help, looking at the manufacturer data, they're, they're able to, to um, sense a much smaller fire at this kind of distance in, okay. in, sec in less than 10 seconds. So, um, you know, when we start getting to the size of fire that we're talking about, um, the hundred second will be well below that hundred seconds before we're even, even under a stage though. I mean, if I, I, the stages are fairly large when Billy Joel comes to the dome. Mm -hmm. And so, and they're, they're all covered with drip. There's, there's coverings hanging off the side to, so that you don't see underneath all that equipment. And so there's quite a large area. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure there's actually a mechanical mechanism for finding what that area. So I guess what I'm looking for is that the acknowledgement, this is a concern and two is there's a plan. How do you address that concern? Um, whether it's a uh, fire watch or whether it's uh, a manual detection uh, devices or temporary detection devices installed underneath the stage. It could be a multitude of things, but yes, I just I wanted mean, to make sure that's, that's addressed. Yes, sir. I think we, yeah, Pete, you can speak. Yeah, to I that. can address that, and Alton Davis, Chief Davis, could address it as well. We have fire marshals around the stage always when we're doing a concert. When Monster Jam takes place, there are four uni fully uh, suited firemen from the city of Syracuse in with the safety personnel at each end of the venue that have access to the field immediately, and they have fire okay. extinguishers. When we do events like where, where we where we refuel or do anything like that with the trucks it is handled by the fire department they're they're with the people we we typically double the amount that the promoter asks for so um again and if there's a, a, a anytime we do a concert it, there's there's a very large i would say fire watch detail around the stage okay well, Chief Davis is uh, is shaking his head up and down for the record, uh, affirming what you're saying, and I, I see some a, a smile on his face. So I think you know <laughs> those things are good. So I I think what we're trying to do is, and, and I appreciate his concern relative to the devices that are being used that are not smoke, but I also understand that this is a complicated environment. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, for me, my only question was about you know the stage when there is an event going on. And, uh, and 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 you and Mr. Oliver, I think you you stated it that there's enough, Mr. Tutulio. Mr. Tutulio. Nope. Sorry about that. Yeah, thank you. Not a blanked out. There we go. <laughs> I'm watching you on the screen, Mr. Oliver. I think uh, uh, you've addressed most of my uh, my my concerns, and I guess I was just throwing some uh, scenarios at you to make sure that they were they have all all been addressed. So. I, I, I'm, I think I'm okay where, where we're at, um, but I, that's me. Mr. Hindelight, where are you on this? Uh, it's, um, do you have any actual documentation from the manufacturers of the smoke detection devices stating that their devices are inadequate or insufficient for this application? You mentioned you know, the lighting, this and that, do you have that actually in writing from them? I do believe we've got some email correspondence. We could, we could pull that together. They, yeah. they actually were the ones who, who kind of suggested the, the flame detector camera, you know, telling us that 
this wouldn't work. So we could prepare that. We do have some of that documentation. Yeah, I I think I'd appreciate that in the record, just that that is a justification. You have the people manufacturing these devices, you know, testing yeah. them. <laughs> if they're the ones saying there's a concern, but they've made a recommendation, I think that should be part of the record. Absolutely. Yes. We have similar info for VESDA, really any any of the systems we you know presented in, in the in the that we can pull together information on how we arrived here. Yeah. You know. Okay. Um, one thing I think I will put in there, and I don't know that it addresses the testing, but um, one thing I will add into um, this that I think will reference NFPA seventy two, the twenty twenty two standard. Um, which should give you, it, it's a broader, every time we go to another generation or standard is provides a little more latitude in, in new technology. So for testing, which was Mr. Harris brought up was a concern, um, you know, how do you test it? Most of these things I am, are in manufacturers uh, commissioning. Um, and the nice thing about is you actually see video and they can, dem they can create some artificial heat sources to validate the coverage area, so to make sure that the whole area is covered. Yeah, adequately. I can speak a little to that. They, I believe they, they shoot kind of a laser, an infrared laser to it, and the, the where we're proposing to mount these, so some of the drawings indicate that, but they're all very accessible. They'll be able to get close enough to them to, to fire the laser at it to test the thing, and, and if they need to get to it in any way, it's uh, very accessible. So yeah. It's it's a it's a new experience if you haven't tested them before. It's a it's an opportunity to, that that you know they, these have been they are listed devices that for what they do. Um, I guess want to make sure we cover the testing and commissioning component. Um, and uh, I think you certainly you know what uh, this may because it's part of a smoke control system. Um, I think the city's well within its right to ask for a you know third party to come in and do the commissioning or oversee the commissioning to validate what they're doing. Um, I think that's a possibility, but that's really up to you and, and the owners to to find that comfort level um, where you're at. But I know that uh, that that if this is an area that's outside of your you know experience level, bringing in a third party who's not related to the design team or the ownership. Um, Certainly, may be something that would give you uh, some, and and they could also look at the the at their analysis and raise other questions. So, but from my standpoint, I'm pretty good with what you presented. Um, Mr. Garlock, do you have anything? Um, not so much a question, but just a you know recommendation. I I don't know if the the uh, the coverage of the visual flame was performed with. Uh, I think it'd be worth you know analyzing that with the basketball grandstand in place. Uh, I, we see a plan here with it, you know, showing a football stadium, uh, but just ensuring that there's the same, you know, that there aren't any blind spots in this system caused by the basketball grandstand. Uh, I think it would also be worth putting, you know, modeling a stage. If it hasn't been completed in with this visual system, uh, again, just you know, getting those blind spots covered with this system, it may, you know, that sort of analysis may require a few more cameras to cover uh, blind spots. I'm not sure, but I think it's worth at least for those two major events. Uh, I could see you know, that happen quite often uh, having. Understood. Yeah, if, if that could be a kind of a, a condition of it, we can prepare those. And, and you're right. If we'll provide the quantity of cameras that's needed to get covered for all the different types of events and scenarios that are occurring at the dome. I, I would just uh, also, I think it's important to acknowledge that the best system that can be installed is one that that provides adequate alarm with a minimal of unwanted alarms and i think that's a, a key component it, it is yeah we we don't want to you know if, if the building's full we don't want to be having a false alarm yeah no i i call them unwanted versus false unwanted. Sometimes, sometimes they're actually doing what they're supposed to be doing but it's not really a hazard convenient to anyone yeah 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 so okay um 
I think we're going to, I think we have enough information. Mm -hmm. um, before we close, anybody else want to, uh, from our video, from our virtual land, does anybody else have any uh, statements they want to make? Okay. Uh, anybody from the city of Syracuse, would you like to make any other additional statements? I just, just like to thank the board for the recommendations uh, for weighing in and, uh, you know, assisting on us getting a grasp on this project. Yeah. Some good, good input that you gave us and I appreciate it. Thank you. Speaking thank you. please. Uh, Elton Davis, E-L-T-O-N, D-A-V-I-S. Thank you. All right. So with that, we're going to take a short recess while we uh, formulate our uh, decision and uh, we'll be back in about uh, 10 minutes. We can go We're off the, the record. record. We're on the record. Okay, very good. Uh, welcome back. We are now uh, back uh, reopening our hearing regarding uh, uh, petition number 2023. 2023-0559. Uh, this is uh, in regards to the JMA Wireless Dome located at 900 Irving Ave in the city of Syracuse. And the applicant is uh, Pete Sala, Vice President for Syracuse University. Um, before we uh, entertain a motion, I just want to make everybody aware this has to be a unanimous vote because we um, only have three members of a five member board present. So, um, so everybody's aware of that. So if you, if you, well, I think I know where the vote's going to be. Just want to let everybody. All right. And do we have a motion? Yes, I'd like to make a motion. Mr. Garlack, I'd like to make a motion. With respect to the petition of P. Sala, VP for Syracuse University, petition number 2023-0559, Requesting a variance to the following sections of the Uniform Code. Petition pertains to a variant seeking relief for alternative smoke and fire detection for the event area for an athletic arena stadium. The building is approximately 414,000 square feet with three service levels known as the JMA Wireless Dome located at 900 Irving Avenue, the city of Syracuse, County of Onondaga, New York State. Public notice was published in the New York State Register's November 8, 2023 issue. Petitioner is seeking relief from 19 NY CRR Part 1221, the 2020 Building Code of New York, Section 907.2.1.3, Automatic Smoke Detection System, which states, a smoke detection system that activates the occupant notification system in accordance with Section 907.5, shall be installed in group A occupancies unless the fire area is protected with an automatic sprinkler system that activates the occupant notification system installed in accordance with section 903.3.1.1. Petitioner seeking relief for a variance to allow visual image flame detection system in lieu of a sensor or beam detection system in the event arena area. The board makes the following findings. One, the building that is the subject of this petition is known as JMA Wireless Dome, located at Syracuse University campus at 905 to 925 Irving Avenue, City of Syracuse, County of Onondaga, State of New York. Two, the building subject to the petition is an athletic stadium, which is covered by a fabric membrane constructed circa 1980, which is of type 1B construction. The area that is subject is a multi-use staging area of approximately 3,522 square feet located on the ground level. The overall stadium is 527,320 square feet facility. Three, the subject building known as the JMA Wireless Dome is, is an existing group A4 enclosed arena designed to accommodate 49,057 spectators. The dome was originally constructed under the State Building Construction Code of 1978 as a Type 1B non-combustible construction, non-sprinkler building. Over the years, the building has gone through various renovations, including installation of sprinkler 
sprinkler protection in various locations throughout the service level, designated, designating the building as partially sprinklered. Four, the subject building is ongoing a level two alteration, and as part of the work, a new smoke and fire detection system is required. Five, the project scope includes the following work. Renovation of the seating bowl to widen the seating bowl aisles. Note that as part of this project, previously approved variants 2017-0180 to allow for reduced aisle widths within the existing building will no longer be required as such aisles within the seating bowl are being increased accordingly. Renovations to existing guardrails to address sight line constraints. Replacement of the existing bench style seating with individual seats to increase the level of fan experience. Note that this results in a total reduction of approximately 6,400 fixed seats throughout the seating bowls. Installation of mechanical smoke control within the main and upper concourses to allow for the use of smoke protected assembly seating provisions of the UC NYS section 1029.6. Point two, installation of automatic sprinkler systems throughout concourses and auxiliary spaces, i.e. concessions, restrooms, etc., as required for smoke-protected assembly buildings. Installation of video imaging fire detection within the seating bowl, capable of viewing the seating bowl and event field. Note that the existing arena does not currently contain a means of fire or smoke detection within the existing non-sprinklered seating bowl and playing field areas directly below the high, high dome roof. The inclusion of a means of detection would increase the level of protection currently provided. Renovation to existing security command areas to comply with the fire command center requirements of 2020 UCNYS section 911 as required for facilities utilizing smoke protected assembly seating provisions. Number six, the petitioner's engineer states in exhibit A that due to the various prohibited features of these other systems and existing conditions of the JMA dome, a review of automatic detection technology available on the market, which led to the design team in determining that the video imaging flame detection system such as the FIKE IR3 flame detector product meets the intent of the code as an initiating device of the fire alarm system and meets the constructability and light level constraints of the existing building. Seven, the petitioner's engineer states in Exhibit A that it should be noted that other provisions within the code, such as UCNYS section 907.4.3 figure four, do note that when an automatic smoke detection system is required, it shall utilize smoke detectors unless ambient conditions prohibit such an installation. This is similar to the spirit of NFPA 72 section 10.4.7.1 figure five, which outlines <clears throat> that initiating devices shall be selected and installed to minimize unwarranted alarms which must take into account environmental conditions as well as maintain the overarching life safety output function, i.e. occupant notification, door closures, smoke control initiation, et cetera. Furthermore, NFPA 72 section A.17.8.3.2.1 identifies that video flame detection is considered a suitable method of detection within high ceiling open space buildings, which the JMA wireless dome seating bowl is considered. A petitioner states in exhibit A that the specifying engineer of record, ME engineers, for the fire alarm and detection systems that include, are included in attachment A, it is intended to utilize the fire IR3-AS21 video image flame detection product to provide automatic detection within the JMA wireless dome seating bowl and event floor. Such equipment is, attended, is intended to be installed along the underside of the ring beam around the perimeter of the building, as well as the underside of the camera platforms on the north side of the seating bowl to provide appropriate coverage throughout the seating bowl and event floor. 
nine, the petitioner states in Exhibit A that the intended <clears throat> bike IR3 AS21 video image flame detection product utilizes triple infrared detection capable of detecting all types of hydrocarbon fibers, fires, visible and non visible, with slow growing fires as well as fast eruption fires capable of operating in various light conditions and having the high immunity to false alarms. Such <laughs> characteristics aid in not only allowing for fast detection within the seating bowl of that floor, also prevent false alarms that can incorrectly initiate occupant notification during a non-fire event. 10, the petitioner states in Exhibit A that as identified in Attachment B, Bike has performed various full scale tests to determine activation time for the IR3 product line. As noted in the data sheet, such products have been tested utilizing various commodities, distances, and sensitivity levels, <clears throat> all of which had alarm initiation occur in less than 10 seconds after fire ignition. The flame detectors are proposed to be mounted to provide an approximately 300 foot horizontal coverage which based on the fight produced testing information will allow the VIFD detector to activate within the 100 second threshold as determined necessary within the approved smoke control rational analysis. Note that such threshold was determined to allow for the overall protection scheme to comply with section 909.4.6 and maintain tenable conditions within the smoke protected assembly seating bowl an event floor for a minimum of 20 minutes after detection or 1.5 times the calculated egress time, whichever is greater. 11, the local code official has been consulted in this matter and supports the granting of the variance under part 1205. And 12, the granting of this variance will not substantially adversely affect the code's provisions for safety, health, and security of the public. In accordance with the above findings, the board finds that in the case before it, strict compliance with the provisions of the New York State Uniform Fire Prevention and Building Code would entail practical difficulty, difficulties and unnecessary hardship and would be physically or legally impractical and would be unnecessary in light of alternatives which ensure the achievement of the code's intended objective or in light of alternatives which, without a loss in the level of safety, achieve the code's intended objective more efficiently, effectively, or economically. Therefore, I move that the above petition be granted with the following conditions. <clears throat> One, that the flame detector coverage is modeled under various types of events and configurations of the event space, including but not limited to basketball games, concerts, motocross, etc. Flame detector quantities and locations shall be configured to provide ad adequate coverage of the open arena space. And that all other aspects of this building and construction shall be in compliance with the applicable codes, rules, and regulations. <clears throat> Furthermore, it should be noted that the decision of the board is limited to the specific building and application before it is contained within the petition and should not be interpreted to give implied approval of any general plans or specifications presented in support of this application. So before I ask for a second, I just want to add one other condition. Um, I don't know if this will help, um, but it may. Um, but that additional condition that the design installation and testing requirements uh, where Specificity is lacking in NFPA 72, um, uh, currently enforced uh, by the New York State Fire Prevention Building Code, um, be substituted uh, with NFPA 72, the 2022 version, which may have more specificity for testing uh, installation of this type of detection system. So I'd like yeah. to amend that as a friendly yeah. amendment. I concur with the amending to add condition number two as stated. Okay, thank you. Uh, request the second. I will second with the amendment. Okay, I'll pull the board, Mr. Enderleiter. Aye. Mr. Garlett. Aye. Chair votes aye, three ayes, no nays. The variance is granted. Oh, any questions, Mr. Oliver? No, no, we've. Um... 
we will comply with all those conditions and uh, thank you everyone on the board for, for your time and consideration. We just out of curiosity, what was the evacuation time of uh, the dome? What is it calculated as? Oh, I can dig that up for you one second, but it was, it was, it was, uh, excuse me here. I can get you. Some games has taken me 20 minutes just to get out out to the concourse. <laughs> it's an emergency. Not an emergency. <laughs> I found it in okay. I was just Brian. Uh, the report is showing um, calculated evacuation time um, from the highest level of the upper seating bowl is 1,130 seconds. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know it's what that Brian. is. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, yeah, it's <laughs> not a high volume up there. It affects a lot of smoke and stuff. So, yes. okay. Very good. Yeah, they have to do 1.5 times that. Yeah. All right. Uh, any other? Uh, uh, so I'm sorry to interrupt you. Was getting some additional info on how we arrived to this. Is that also a stipulation? You guys want to still see that? The... That's. I guess that's really up to the local code enforcer what they would like in their records. Right. Okay. Mr. Carson was just curious. Does yeah. he can't get out of there and have to get to his car before he gets blocked in? <laughs> All right, thank you, gentlemen. We got to work on his parking. <laughs> okay. well, Maureen, we're, we can go off the record. This uh, hearing is now adjourned. We're off the record. <laughs>